r slash no sleep posted by u slash mk underscore matrix i'm a cop and i'm never working the night shift again working the graveyard shift as a cop sucks for a myriad of reasons chief among them being the eeriness of the night now saying that might make me sound like a baby considering that i'm no small dude but it's true something about being stuck in your car with no human life in sight has an almost alien feeling to it I'm sure it would help if I lived in an area that wasn't as heavily forested as Wyoming, but as it stands, if there's a light on near me, I almost can't see it with how dense the foliage is. Most nights, there's nothing to do, so it's just me and the silence. I usually take the time to catch up on a show I'm watching, or finish a book. On the off chance I do get a call, it's always something small, like a wellness check or a suspicious character outside a bar. I'm always happy to take these calls, though as it gets me back towards populated areas rather than some gravel road where they have me scouting for speeders. It's not an exciting job, but it pays the bills. It happened two days ago, on a relatively warm night. I was working my first night shift in a while, after getting back from vacation. Jimmy, the officer who replaced me while I was out, told me that he finally understood what I was talking about when I said it was creepy. I chuckled, assuring him that I would take over for a while and advised him to bring something to do next time to keep his mind off it. If anyone were to understand what the transition from day to night shift was like, it would be me, so I tried to make him comfortable. After all, if he started taking them more, I wouldn't have to sit in the darkness as much. He handed me the keys, and I had an idea. This was the only night shift I was scheduled for that week, why not make it a little more bearable? I decided to invite him along. He could either sit at a desk all night in a dimly lit precinct with only one other person, or hang out and shoot the shit in the cruiser. Honestly, I don't think the blinding white walls of the station are that much more comforting than the darkness, and I think he agreed, because he accepted the offer pretty quickly. We parked on one of our designated hiding spots and settled in, watching some shitty horror movie and cracking open a few beers. Sure, we shouldn't have been doing that, but who was gonna arrest us for it? We weren't small guys, either so it would take more than a couple of beers to get us tipsy. We also didn't expect to be moving much, until my work phone rang. I sighed, rubbed my eyes, and answered it. It was already 3 a.m., so at least we'd made it halfway through the shift before something happened. I immediately heard giggling on the other end. I said hello a few times, and was about to hang up when I heard a voice on the other end of the line. It was Brian, the only other officer on duty that night, and he was in charge of manning the station's phone. Usually, he was as monotone as a depressed robot, so to hear him laugh was already weird. Hey Tom, how's it going? I can't complain. Just living the high life with Jimmy here. What's up? You're not gonna believe this shit. I got an emergency call from the old Amic factory on McHaven Road. How? That place doesn't have any power, or phones even. That's why I'm laughing my ass off. The person who called said they broke into the place to try and steal equipment and now they're somehow stuck inside. It was silent in the cruiser for a second. Jimmy and I slowly turned to look at each other, and then, almost simultaneously, we burst out laughing. You're shitting me. I'm dead serious. When I got the call, I almost pissed myself trying not to laugh at the poor bastard. I'm about to piss myself right now. Hell, I think Jimmy already did. Jimmy jokingly slugged me in the shoulder as Brian began to talk again. Anyways, do me a favor and go and help the guy get out of there. It's your choice whether you want to arrest him for trespassing or not, but he's had a bad enough night as is, by the sounds of it. We'll take care of it. Beats giving another speeding ticket. I don't know if I'm gonna be able to keep a straight face, though. I sure as shit wouldn't be able to. Give me a call back if you need backup, alright? I'll have to call the precinct up in Pinedale if you do, they have their parade this week, so I'm sure they've got a few guys to spare. Sounds good. Brian. We'll keep you posted. I hung up, and flicked the cruiser's lights on, piercing through the darkness. We peeled out onto the road, making sure not to hit any deer along the way. It was only about a 10 minute drive, but you never know. We pulled into the bramble covered entrance to the building, and I got out of the car to undo the rusted chain blocking the road. The place had been abandoned for 10 years, after Amic moved its drilling operations up north and took half the town's population with them. Now, the place was just a drinking spot for local teens, and it showed, with the amount of graffiti sprayed along the sides. We got out of the cruiser, flicked our flashlights on, and started looking for an entrance. Jimmy was noticeably on edge, probably because he didn't know this place existed. He was relatively new to the area, 
and I'm pretty sure this was his first time having to get out of the car on the night shift, although I didn't ask. He went around the left side of the building, while I took the right, both of us looking for a rusted door or a busted window. I was peeling brambles off of my shorts when I heard Jimmy start yelling. I immediately hightailed it back towards the other side of the building, hand on my holster, preparing for the worst. Was this a trap? Maybe the dude we came here to find was some sicko looking to hurt us, or worse. I sprinted around the corner, shining my flashlight in front of me and expecting the worst. My flashlight illuminated Jimmy, who was doubled over laughing. I was confused, and immediately asked if he was alright. He looked up at me, with the widest grin I'd ever seen him sporting. I totally got you. I was relieved that nothing actually happened, but was mostly annoyed that he did that to me. It was almost 4 o'clock in the morning, for God's sake, and we were on the tail of some idiot in the middle of an abandoned warehouse. For a second, I'd thought he was getting attacked, and would be lying in a bloody heap by the time I got over to him. I think he saw that I was pissed, because his face immediately sank and he started to apologize, saying he was just trying to lighten the mood. I took a deep breath and smiled at him, I assured him that I'd get him back at some point, and to just focus on getting in for now. We found a broken window that we assumed he'd climbed in through, and shined our flashlights on the floor inside to make sure we weren't about to step on nails or something. As we climbed into the place, I radioed Brian and asked him to call a few other officers over to us, just in case something went wrong. After the shit Jimmy pulled, I was on edge that something bad would actually happen, so I figured it was better to be safe than sorry. The power in the place still didn't work, in hindsight, I have no idea why I even bothered checking so it looked like we were gonna have to put our flashlights to work. We called out a few times into the darkness, seeing if we'd get a response, but to no avail. We walked past the old drills and ore processors, our feet clicking against the concrete floor. After searching the bulk of the main room, we headed for the hallway at the very back of the factory. I knew this place pretty well, since I'd been called there during the daytime a few years back to clear out some drunk partiers who'd snuck in. Still, it was a whole different beast at night and the fact that the hallway immediately branched into three more didn't help. This is where we made our first mistake, and it was a pretty stupid one. We decided to split up. I know, I know, it's how horror movies start, and how characters die, but we were both tired, and our energy drinks were wearing off. We agreed that we'd keep our radios on at all times, and let each other know if we found the guy. At this point, I'd assumed that he'd found his way out and ran into the woods in fear of being arrested, but we still had to sweep the place just in case. I wasn't planning on arresting the guy, as I figured that he'd had a bad enough night at that point, and the old equipment he was planning on taking wasn't of any use to anyone anymore, so I would've let him off with a warning. Now, though, I was starting to change my mind, I didn't want to have to search the entire back half of this place, especially given the fact that there were three floors worth of rooms here. It didn't help that the building was split into two sides that weren't connected, so if one of us found something, the other would have to walk all the way over to them. I was starting to understand why this place wasn't used anymore. Every time I passed a room, I'd shine my flashlight in and call out. As evidenced by Jimmy's voice over the radio, he had a similar system going on. When I reached the first room of the second floor, he was already on the third, so I warned him to slow down a little bit just to make sure that each room was completely clear. I was met with complete silence, and repeated myself. Still, nothing. Hey, Tom. I see something. What is it? Down the hall from me. There's a hand sticking out of the doorway. I stopped in my tracks. What do you mean? There's a hand waggling its finger at me. I'll be right over. Don't go near it, don't do shit. Slowly back up, in fact. I started towards the stairs, admittedly slower than I should have. At this point, I was creeped out, but the rational side of me was still telling me that someone had gotten stuck and was motioning for Jimmy to come closer to help them. When I reached the first floor of my building, the other side of me started screaming at me to get moving, and that's the side I started listening to. As I approached the entrance to the other building, my radio suddenly erupted. Tom. What? What is it? There's a face. There's someone looking at me. I didn't respond. I just broke into a sprint, towards the access door at the end of the hall. I grabbed the handle, and pushed. It didn't budge. I rammed my shoulder into it, screaming Jimmy's name. Behind the door, I heard faint yelling. The door finally gave out, and I started sprinting up the dark staircase. I took my gun out of my holster, whatever was going on up there, it wasn't good. I reached the entrance of the third floor, and again, the door was locked. 
I bashed my shoulder into the door once again, calling his name. This time, though, there was no response, no screaming, just silence. I drew my pistol and unloaded almost the entire clip into the lock. The door still didn't budge, something had to be blocking it from the other side. I slammed against the door so hard that things started flying off my belt. First my knife, then my taser, then my flashlight. I stopped for a second to pick it up, but it just kept rolling until it hit the edge of the stairwell and fell down. I couldn't see shit anymore, but I didn't have time to go get it. The door was starting to push open, and I had to get through. I kicked it so hard, I thought I broke my ankle, but I didn't care. It finally caved in enough for me to slip through into the hallway. I once again called out Jimmy's name and as my eyes adjusted to the darkness, I saw a light on at the end of the hallway. Not a flashlight, but a very dimly lit room. Standing in the doorway was a silhouette, it had to be him. I called out to him again, but didn't step closer. The silence was broken when the giggling started. It was faint enough that I couldn't tell if it was him, but it sounded like it. The giggling turned to laughter, and he started to move, but didn't leave the doorway, he was just moving in place, jerking from side to side, it looked like he was dancing. I lowered my gun, and called out to him again. I knew what was happening. He was fucking with me. All of this was a setup to prank me again. I was royally pissed off, and started screaming down the hallway. Are you fucking kidding me? I thought someone was attacking you, dude. I fucking told you earlier to stop messing around, and now you nearly give me a heart attack by doing this shit? What the fuck is wrong with you? I put my gun back in my belt and turned back towards the door. I'd had more than enough for one night. I'm going outside to wait for the backup to get here, and going with them back to our station. When you're ready to stop fucking around, take the car and don't talk to me for a week. This is seriously fucked up. I stormed out the broken door and picked up all of my stuff. I climbed back out through the window and stood in the darkness in front of the factory, waiting for backup to arrive. Luckily, they were well on their way already and got there about 5 minutes after I got outside. I hopped into the back seat of their cruiser and buckled myself in. Whenever you're ready, you can drive me back to the station. It's 20 minutes down the main road. The officer behind the wheel turned to look at me, then turned back towards the wheel and pointed to the factory. Don't you want to wait for your partner? It looks like he's at the window up there. I rolled the window down and looked outside. Sure enough, there was a faint light coming from one of the windows, what looked to be a flashlight beam, illuminating someone's silhouette. He'll take our car back to the station. I'm pissed off at him right now, so he can take care of it. With a nod, the officer shifted into reverse, and we backed out onto the main road. Once we got back to the precinct, I thanked them for the lift, and immediately hopped into my truck and drove back home. I was exhausted, and didn't really care to wait for Jimmy to bring the car in. Jimmy didn't show up for work yesterday, and he didn't return the car, either. We thought he'd just taken a sick day and forgot to phone in, or maybe he was scared to face me after his little prank backfired. Everyone I told about it seemed to be on my side, and maybe he knew I'd tell people about it, so I thought he was afraid of corrective action. At least, that was my theory yesterday. He didn't show up today, either, and everyone started to get a bit worried, even me. We sent a couple of officers out to the factory to see if he had left in the cruiser, or took an Uber home and left it there. Sure enough, it was parked in the same spot. When they saw this, they phoned me to come in to help search the area, just in case. It was my day off, so I was irritated, but I did hope he was okay, so I relented. We searched the entire factory, and didn't find anything until we got to the third floor hallway that we'd been on a few days ago. I got up the stairs last, and found one officer vomiting in the corner of the stairwell, and the other shielding his eyes in disgust. I pushed past them and walked into the hallway. The floor was stained with a trail of blood leading towards the end of the hall. There, hanging from the doorway, was Jimmy. He'd been absolutely mangled. His stomach was eviscerated, and his eyes and tongue were missing. Most notably, though, were his arms and legs. The veins had been almost completely ripped from them, and braided so tightly together that they formed makeshift ropes. Seeing this, I didn't immediately join the other officer in vomiting, I just stood there, completely stunned. That changed, though when I walked into the room behind his body. Above him, attached to the doorway, was a makeshift pulley system. A system that his veins had been run through, almost like he was a puppet.